our webinar. We're so happy to have you here. We have some awesome speakers today, Art Tandrup and Dale Goebbels. They are both some of the most wonderful and entertaining people that I have come in contact with over my term with AmeriCorps, so I'm really happy to have them both here today. While we're waiting for some more people to join us, I'm just going to kind of go over some of the things that Conservation Nebraska does. And um, if this is your first webinar too, I'll kind of inform you how this all works and, and um, how much, hi Ben, <laughs> and uh, how much time we're gonna have. All right, so Conservation Nebraska is a nonprofit organization that is um, funded through AmeriCorps. We do events like this all throughout the state. We have a bunch of different regions, so I'm part of the Northeast region in Omaha. Um, it's been an honor to work this term. Basically what we do is we go into our designated um, areas, our regions, and we figure out what environmental issues that the specific city or town really cares about and try and pinpoint different events that we can put on that will bring in the most people and that will bring in the most interest. So I thought that this one is a great one for Fremont, which is supposed to be the area, but I know we're gonna have a lot of Omaha participants here today. So the recycling aspect with Dale kind of brings in that Omaha characteristics. Um, a little background of our speakers, Art Tanderup, is a Nebraska farmer and retired teacher and union rep. He is, as well as many other things, a few of them are a pipeline fighter, a water protector, a ponca corn planter, a solar booster, a tractor crop artist, and many other things. He's all across the board. Dale has over 35 years of experience in recycling and environmental consulting. He's also a native Nebraskan and was one of the first executive directors of the Nebraska State Recycling Association. So we've got two very experienced people here today and um, I'm sure as well as you guys, I'm just so excited to hear them speak. A little thing, a few things about the event and how it's gonna be facilitated. Um, you cannot be seen or heard. So you're muted at all times and your video will never come on. So if you're eating breakfast, you know, drinking some coffee, no worries, we won't see you. Um, and there is a Q&A box there. If you kind of move your little, your little mouse on the screen, it'll pop up there. So if you have any questions, I see some people are already putting in the chat some things. So you can either put questions in the chat or the Q&A. And after each speaker, I'm just going to read off your questions to the speaker. So after Art's gonna start us up here, and after he goes, you can ask whatever questions you have into the chat or the Q&A, and we'll go over that until those are all done, and then we'll switch over to Dale. A little fun thing about this event, if you guys have a little bit of time after the two speakers present, um, they are going to go over, they're just gonna have a discussion. So I thought that would be a little fun, a little different than how most of these events are going. And then you can kind of just hear them talk about their different areas of expertise. So, all right, um, we've got quite a few people in, so I'm going to hand the mic off to Art. And Art, you can start whenever you are ready. Thanks again, everybody, for being here. Well, good morning, everyone. And as, uh, I always like to do. I like to welcome you to our farm uh, here north of Neely, Nebraska. And today, you know, I'm 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 going to take you on a journey through some of the things that we've done with our farm to make it uh, more sustainable, uh, to make it uh, a better place uh, for the world, and to you know try and try and make some small steps in the right direction. Uh, so with that, I think I'll, I'll see if I can get this PowerPoint loaded up here and we will go with that. And um, let's see here. I, oh, there's my play button. Okay. So um, uh, 
this is myself and my wife Helen out uh, out in our field out here and of course we always like to see something growing and we have have something growing there. Uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about quite a few different things uh, you know and like I said, we have a journey here on the Tandrup Farm. We're going to we're going to be talking about uh, uh, you know how we have transitioned into no-till farming, cover crops, uh, and conserving irrigation. Uh, we're going to talk about the sacred ponca corn that we uh, uh, that we grow. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about sun power and. Uh, we're just just kind of in general stewardship of the earth because that's that's something we feel is so important these days and something that all of us have to you know have to take into consideration uh you know we can't just go on destroying things we have to start we have to start building up and making this earth a better place to be this is our farm uh we're um, north of neely nebraska like nine miles and um, uh, this uh, this particular farm has been in Helen's family for 103 years, and uh, it was uh, you know her grandfather uh, moved here after World War One, and it was it was barren prairie at that time, and he uh, he developed it, and uh, then uh, Helen's parents uh, came along and they farmed it for years, and then uh, uh, actually while we were while I was still teaching at Tacoma Herman. Uh, our our uh, our renter couldn't farm it anymore, so I started farming it myself. And uh, we had like a hundred and thirty-two mile commute commute to farm this, but we made it work. Um, so one of the things that uh, probably all of you know, change is challenging, and uh, it's it's difficult to make some of these changes. I look back, and this emblem was on the. Um, FFA jacket that I wore for so many years. And you will notice towards the bottom of this emblem is the plow. And so you had to, you know, the our upbringing was tilling the soil. That's how you farmed, you tilled. You tilled that soil. And so, you know, today this is still the emblem. However, I know for a fact because of my friends that, uh, that are FFA sponsors and ag teachers uh, that, uh, you know, they're teaching, they're teaching about soil health. They're teaching about uh, no-till and regenerative farming. They're teaching these, these newer things. Um, so we had, you know, some of this historical uh, tillage practices. We plowed, we dissed, we chiseled, plowed, we filled, cultivated. And then quite a few years ago, um, people decided, well, maybe that old plow is a little too much every year, so let's just go to discs and chisel plows and field cultivators. But you know, we'll, we'll disc it once early and then we'll come back right before we plant it and we'll disc that thing again and we'll make it look pretty. And then, you know, people would plant with either a lister or a planter and of course the lister would really disturb that up again and hill it up. And then after the crop was up, they'd cultivate it one, two or three times. Now, what myself and so many other farmers have done is they've just committed first degree soil murder because they've killed all the living organisms that are in our soil. They've killed those microorganisms, they've killed those worms, and nothing is alive underneath there. So we've got to see how we can work together with that soil to make it better. And of course, some of the costs of this are, are getting tremendous. These are recent uh, uh, costs. You know, you're looking at significant money here to, to do some of these things, as well as time, fuel, et cetera. Um, we live in the Nebraska Sand Hills, uh, the Eastern Sand Hills, that is. And so, and, and as you know, the Sand Hills covers a large portion of the state of Nebraska. And it's a very, a very unique ecosystem. Here's a picture of, uh, of some of our sand. We have mostly Thurman fine sand. And this was the other morning after we had an inch of rain. And you can tell it's a little bit damp, but uh, normally this sand is very dry and it will, it will blow, it's very porous. Uh, you know, it has, has characteristics which make it challenging. 
uh, and on our farm, you know, just you know, if I'm lying to you, we have cactus out here. We have several of these located in various spots on our farm, and of course, we love it when they bloom. They're very pretty. Um, now, how to farm in the sand? It's a little bit different than most farming environments, because first of all, you have to keep it from blowing. You have to keep the rain from washing it away. It's nice if you can keep it damp. And you should keep it covered with something growing as much of the year as you can. And it's nice to keep it covered with some plant residue. And then underneath, you need to keep that soil alive with roots, worms, and microorganisms. A lot of things there, a lot of challenges. First thing you have to do is you have to slow that wind down. And uh, the ancestors that were here, you know, parents, grandparents, and so forth, you know, they figured out fast, if you plant trees, that will help slow the wind down. Here's the shelter belt uh, along the edge of our farm. Uh, these are cottonwood trees, approximately 100 years old. Helen's grandparents uh, planted these. And uh, what they would do is they would uh, go to Neely, they'd take their milk and eggs, and sometimes they'd take some uh, uh, grain in to be ground into flour at the, at the Neely mill there. And then they would, before they came home, they would go down by the river and they would dig up some little saplings and they would bring them out here on the farm and then they would plant them. And so they were able to develop, uh, develop tree strips around the farm as well as trees uh, around where the building site is here. This is the shelter belt, uh, cedar shelter belt that I put in in the late, uh, uh, in the late 90s. And that also effective in helping slow down the wind. This is not on our farm, but it's just down the road a few miles here. And this is a, a strategy that was used kind of starting back in the mid 60s, where people would go out and plant single rows of cedar trees down through their fields. And uh, this one here is just a picture of two of these strips, but they're actually about five strips here. And they're not very far apart. And so the cedars would come up and then that would leave, that would leave the space in between that would, uh, you know, pretty much keep the sand from cutting the plants off and, you know, it would cut that blowing down tremendously. And this is another practice that has been used for years. Helen's grandfather and parents used this technique where you would plant uh, uh, like rye, which uh, rye, you know, you have to plant it in the fall, it comes up, and then uh, early spring it starts growing again, and it provides a nice green cover out there. And then uh, you can see right next to it is a, is a little narrow strip of corn. So this farmer went out and tilled up that uh, little narrow strip and, and planted corn in there, and just the other side of it's a strip of rye. So this is how a lot of the fields would look, where they would have a strip of this, a strip of that, and, and the whole idea is to cut down on that wind erosion. Now, uh, here a couple years ago, they decided that they'd put these big, uh, uh, wind machines up that would supposedly slow them, uh, you know, slow the wind down a little bit in our area. And, uh, you know, I can't see that they made much difference, but they, they sure do put out one heck of a megawatt. So we'll, we'll live with them and we're okay with that. Okay, so starting to no-till. The neighbor says it won't work. They tried it in the 80s and it didn't work. Well, so we tried it. So the first few, few years, boy, it was painful. You had corn stalks uh, throwing your planter chains off. They'd catch a hold of the uh, wiring on the planter and pull that loose. And you had trash that was constantly plugging up the uh, planter. When it did come up in the spring, oh, it, it looked terrible, way behind the neighbor's uh, crop. You know, and, uh, you know, one of them uh, didn't think he was being impolite to me, but he says, you know, your corn looks terrible. So, you know, you're constantly uh, learning and making changes. And one of the advantages that I had is I had a couple no-till coaches. Uh, that ag teacher uh, that I worked with and another teacher uh, at Tecama Herman, um, 
the ag teacher, of course, did no-till. He taught no-till. So we had a lot of conversations on, on what to do and how to do it, and how to overcome a lot of the issues that we were having with it. And the same, the same with this other teacher whose husband, uh, you know, farmed uh, completely with no-till. Uh, and so it's always good, you know, to have somebody to bounce some of these things off. And, and I think sometimes I get so discouraged that I was ready to give up. But we kept doing it. And each year we saw significant, significant improvement. And we soon learned, you know, just, uh, just doing no-till really isn't enough because the more we learned about soil and so forth, the more we learned uh, that you need more than that. And so here, here's a picture of uh, a corn in the fall and we, um, we fly on rye on our corn acres, and this is the rye coming up out in that field in uh, probably mid-September here. Um, also, use a no-till drill to um, uh, to seed. Uh, like here, I'm. This is a piece where we took rye out, and I just completed uh, sowing rye in it again. When we harvest soybeans, we're out there with that no-till till drill as soon as we can, and uh, we're seeding that soybean stubble down uh, with, uh, with rye and radishes. Uh, and it's one of those things, I'm kind of a one-man operation and not a big operation, so if, uh, if I can't combine someday, I'm, I'm out there sowing as soon as I can. If, uh, if I had my wishes, I'd have uh, somebody in that tractor and drill following the combine around the field, because it's important to get that in the ground and keep things going. Uh, here's here's a rye and radish cover crop. The uh, uh, the big green thing you see there, that's what's called a tillage radish, um, and uh, sometimes they're referred to as a daikon radish. And and these rascals uh, do a, a, a fantastic job. Uh, so some of the benefits of 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 using these cover crops is that they forage your nitrogen and your other nutrients. And the roots help break up compaction. Uh, that's, that's very important. And that tillage radish is, is very good with that. Uh, those fellers will, uh, you know, sometimes they look about the size of carrots or turnips. And sometimes if they get to grow long enough, they might be three or four inches across at the top and uh, might be 16 to 20 inches long into the ground. So um, uh, they're very beneficial in breaking that compaction up. Okay, also providing uh, cover for the soil and building that organic matter. And of course, too, a positive, positive thing, it creates livestock feed if you have some livestock to come in and eat that. Uh, to um, kill the cover crop in the spring before we plant, I use what's called a roller crimper. And uh, here, here we're out in a rye field that was about probably close to a foot tall, maybe a little taller, and uh, we're out there crimping. This is a close-up of that crimper, and you will notice the blades aren't sharp; they're flat. And the reason is you don't want to cut, you don't want to cut the plant off because it'll just grow back. So that flat surface on the crimper allows the stem to be crimped where it can no longer feed the plant. And so then it'll, it'll start to dry. And this, um, you'll see this is, it's round and it's a tube and you can fill this up with water. And so through, you know, kind of experimenting and so forth, um, I learned that if I filled it clear full of water, I couldn't turn the tractor around without using brakes. Uh, and, uh, and it would cut some of uh, some of the cover crop off. So uh, I finally realized, or came to the conclusion: if I fill it half full, it's just right to do what I need to do. Now this is a this is a field that's just been crimped, uh, a rye field. And uh, uh, my neighbor came over and looked at that, and he says, "Just what the heck did you do out there?" And I said, "Well, I crimped this field of rye." And he says, boy, if that was mine, I'd get the disc out and I'd make green manure out of that and we'd have a great crop. And I said, well, we're going to have a great crop too, but it's going to look a little different than yours. 
Uh, so this is uh, that same field about a week later, and you will see that most of it is, is uh, dying out. You will see the little green patch here, and uh, that's, that's an operator error where I got the crimper up on the side of the lane, so it did not, uh, it did not crimp that little patch of, of rye. Now, we get into, uh, you know, the residue. We, we, you know, one of the key things with no-tilling is having, is having residue, and look how that uh, covers the ground. I don't think you can see any soil there in, uh, in that picture. And we have lots of benefits to that residue. First of all, it mulches, it mulches the ground. It helps with weed control. It does help keep it 10 to 20 degrees cooler than bare ground. Now, this is the, the critics in no-till are going to say that coolness keeps you out of the field in the spring of the year when you should be planting. And that is one thing you do have to wait just a little bit longer till your ground temperature warms up enough to plant. But it's, it's well worth those uh, few days of waiting. Okay, it also prevents uh, erosion and helps to hold moisture. And uh, the plant's gonna utilize some of that carbon as it decays. And the microorganisms and worms in the soil, they just thrive underneath this. And so your remaining carbon will be sequestered rather than released into the atmosphere and contribute to this thing that some people don't wanna call climate change. And of course, it continues to build soil organic matter. Now here's uh, this year, here we have some uh, the combination of the rye and the corn stalk residue. And uh, these little corns are just uh, just coming up through that. And uh, so they're, they're kind of getting a, getting a start here. And, uh, you know, some people would say they look a little sickly, but they're, they're gonna be just fine because they've been growing roots as much as they're growing uh, plant growth above ground. So they're getting a great foundation as they start off. Now here's, here's some uh, uh, corn that we planted into that rye residue. And uh, you'll notice, uh, I know some of you out there, you probably see if you can find some straw uh, someplace so you can mulch down your, um, uh, your garden plants. Well, this is, we're kind of talking the same thing here. Uh, so this rye uh, is, is dying down. Uh, the corn's coming up through it. And what's really kind of neat is the rye's not only dying above ground, it's dying below ground. And as those roots die, the corn roots are growing. And they find where those rye roots have been, they find those little, those little holes. They also find the worm holes. And they've just found a super highway down into the earth where they can pull up all kinds of nutrients and so forth. So it's, uh, it's something that uh, is, is really beneficial as, as the corn plant uh, uh, develops here. And here in a few weeks, this is what your, the corn looks like. This, this, this particular one is on a corn stalk residue field. There's some rye. Uh, the rye has pretty well deteriorated at this time, but uh, you still have a lot of corn stalk residue uh, above that. Okay, and here, here we have some more in a soybean field. And uh, you'll, you'll recall earlier I talked about uh, when I first started out, my planter. Uh, you know, gosh, I was throwing chains off all the way, all the time, you know, getting out and putting those things on and occasionally fixing a wire that got broke. And when, after you were planted, you would have, uh, well, even at this stage of the soybeans, you would still have all kinds of corn stalks sticking up here, uh, you know, in uh, like the old row there. They would still be sticking up there instead of down into mulch form. Well, the longer you no-till, the more those microorganisms and worms work underneath the ground. And so by the time that we plant in the spring, 
those root balls have pretty much deteriorated. So most of the stalks just fall right over when you're out there planting. They get hit with a little bit of something and they're, and they're down on the ground making this fantastic mulch. We're so blessed in, uh, well, most of Nebraska, in our area in particular, that we have water and irrigation. And of course, that water comes out of the Ogallala Aquifer. And some, uh, uh, sometimes it's referred to as the Great Plains Aquifer, and you can see it stretches, you know, from our area up in, and even up into South Dakota, Colorado, and all the way down into Texas. Many parts of the southern part of this, it's, it's running dry from overuse. In the past, there have been concerns in Nebraska about it running, uh, running low. Here where we're at, uh, that aquifer is very high. Uh, our house well is 70 foot deep. Our irrigation well is 128 foot deep uh, where there's a shale layer. Uh, and when it was test pumped after it was built, it uh, test pumped uh, 1,586 gallons per minute. So we have significant amount of water in that sand and gravel that's between the surface and 128 feet. And just down the road from me, about three and a half miles, the aquifer is so high that there are springs coming out of the road ditches. And that happens almost year round. So it's something, this water source is very precious and I'm very concerned about making sure that we preserve it and use only what we need. So to make that happen, uh, about 20 years ago, I did some research and discovered that you can, uh, you can tell how much moisture is in your soil. With sand, it's very difficult. The picture I showed you early, that wasn't difficult at all. We, it, that was right after we had an inch of rain, but a day later, you wouldn't know it. And that's the way it is with all of our soil. You reach down and you pick it up and you can't tell exactly how much moisture is in it. So uh, we look to scientific methods to help us out there. And we came across um, uh, a gypsum block type monitoring system. So here we have uh, moisture sensors. They're set in the ground at one foot, two foot, and three foot in the ground. And uh, this is an old system. The new ones, the new ones use, uh, you know, like Wi-Fi and all that kind of stuff. For this one, we're, we're still cabling up and it goes up to the soil moisture monitor. This is, we've had to replace the one, the first one that we had. And this little device will, will tell me, will give me a number reading on uh, each of my six uh, soil moisture testers. And uh, then I have a chart that tells me how to convert that into how much water do you need uh, and so forth. And it's, uh, it's amazing. Now, like, you know, we all know how hot it got yesterday and it's going to get hot today. Um, and as I am outside this morning, I'm hearing all kinds of irrigation engines running. I'm seeing pivots running everywhere. Mine's not running because these soil moisture monitor sensors tell me I have enough moisture, so I don't need to be wasting that water at this time. I don't need to waste it. My crop doesn't need it. Uh, on a typical year, we will save three to five inches of water over what our neighbors use. Think about that. If everybody did that, we would never have to worry about the Ogallala Aquifer running out of water. So we need to conserve that valuable resource that we have here in Nebraska. It's also important in kind of a regenerative, no-till, no cover crop type uh, a system to incorporate livestock. I personally don't own any livestock, but uh, I have a neighbor and she brings in about 140 head of cattle 
uh, every winter for about a month. And it's, um, uh, it, it's always, always a good time. And when the cattle come in, the first thing they see is that uh, green rye and those radishes sticking up. And they, they really enjoy that because they haven't seen green for some time. Uh, and they have, you know, they have some soybean stubble to eat. They have some, they have some corn stalks, which uh, mainly they like the leaves and the husks and uh, that sort of thing. And of course, uh, my old combine leaves a few uh, ears of corn for them out there. So, you know, they, they really enjoy, uh, enjoy uh, being here. Uh, but I enjoy having them because you know what they do the organic matter they leave the conversion the conversion of um, uh, residue and so forth into organic matter is uh, is invaluable so uh, it's it's very important uh, you know to incorporate livestock if if I were younger uh, I would probably um, uh, fix up so I could have some livestock on my own and do more regenerative practices uh, year round with them. Okay, well, so far we've talked about lots of things. Change is challenging. We make a lot of mistakes, and I've made I've made a lot of them. A few people get it right the first time. Uh, risks are kind of high, but don't be discouraged. You've got to have a willingness to learn. Uh, and it helps to have a mentor coach, and, and I've had two of those, so I feel blessed for that. Uh, and one of the things, you've you got to educate your banker, because a lot of them have no idea what you're talking about, and everybody else does it this way, and, well, now they aren't making much money, but, you know, you know they can make money, and they're going to pay the bank off. But, so, anyhow, uh, you got to keep those people, you gotta, you got to educate and there's not a perfect solution for anything. So, you know, you, you need to study, you need to find the research. How does it fit into your operation? Attend field days. How are, how are, what they doing going, could that help you out? Uh, go to learning sessions with the experts. And when you want to try out something new, try it on a small scale. Don't, do everything at once but the most important thing is you've got to be a good steward of the earth and part of the part of being a good steward of the earth is when we look back and look at the first uh, uh, the first peoples that were here on this land and and how they were great uh, great stewards of the land and the earth uh, we, we've had an opportunity. It started back in 2013. And uh, I met a young man uh, named Mika C. Hornick from the Oklahoma farm. He came to our farm. And we talked about this being the land of his people. This is the land they roamed, they hunted, they farmed. You know, they were here. They're buried here. It's, it was their land. And he talked about, about the Ponca Nation up north of us, where they mainly resided in the Niobrara area, and how they were driven to Oklahoma, and how when they were driven, they had to leave their planted, uh, they had planted their corn. And corn is, corn is very sacred to them. It's a very, a very important part of their culture but they'd planted their corn for the year and it was in the ground. They had no seed to take with them. Mikasi's grandfather was eight years old at the time. And he, uh, in, in route to Oklahoma, uh, he probably walked across part of our farm, which is on the Ponca Trail of Tears. And Mikasi talked about how it would be great to, um, how it would be great to find some seed and plant that seed back in its homeland. And so he asked me, he said, if, if I can find some seed, will you, would you be willing to plant that seed on your farm? And without hesitation, I said, absolutely. So he, he and another gentleman started on, a, started on a process of finding seed. And what they had to do, their, their land up north here had been given to the Yankton Lakota. And they did know that 
tribes every year they keep a medicine bundle and so they wanted to find that medicine bundle that was 137 years old find that bundle and put see if there was seed in it and see if we could get it so we could plant that seed long story short they found that medicine bundle they bartered and the seed you see there is a 137 year old seed from that medicine bundle and we planted it and it grew you know uh when i plant my corn seed if i have some left over and like well do i uh do i throw it in the planter next year you know how much of it will grow you know this seed is different it's original it's the real thing and it still grew, it had germination 137 years later. But we couldn't just plant just this seed. So they worked with the Pawnee tribe down in the Grand Island area to get some seed from them. And uh, so we planted about four acres of corn. Um, it was uh, all hand planted. Uh, so we had the red, the blue, the gray, the white, the yellow, and the um, uh, we had some uh, mixed, uh, Multiple colored, multiple colored corn as well. And so we, we hand planted it and we hand picked it. Um, it has beautiful leaves. It's very unique. No two plants. Uh, to some people, to most farmers, they would say, well, this has a deficiency in it. But in reality, this is the color of this particular stock. And some of them will be other different colors as well. Uh, here's my wife, Helen, out uh, about a week ago. Uh, and uh, we're seeing the first tassels come up in this year's crop. And uh, right here, this was just taken yesterday, and uh, most of the most of the little field here is uh, uh, is starting to tassel. We're concerned about the heat, but we believe that uh, we can uh, we we should have a crop here this year of uh, of this sacred punk of corn. Uh, from the first year, this was one of the red ears. Uh, they vary in size. This was a, a tiny one, but uh, a beautiful one. And then you will see, uh, you know, everybody likes to show the big ears off, you know, uh, ask any farmer. Uh, and here we have, uh, you know, a red and a blue that are, that are just beautiful as well. And we planted this corn since 2014. So we, uh, you know, we have the different colors planted together. And so they cross a little bit. And then this is, this is kind of a, a seed that, or a, a crossed ear that that we think is pretty is pretty beautiful and uh, nice to look at. Uh, at the end, and well, at the beginning of every year, we do uh, ceremony as well as at the end. Uh, so we plant the corn and we pick it by hand as well. Uh, this year, with the coronavirus. Uh, we had to kind of do some virtual things, so we had Chairman Wright uh, uh, help us with the ceremony and so forth, and uh, uh, blessing of the planner, etc. So, um, but this has been a, you know, to revigorate that corn that has been lost for so many years is, uh, and to make, uh, you know, uh, the people the first year after we harvested that, they took it back to Oklahoma and they planted 80 acres of corn with it the next year. The goal was to use it, you know, for food and medicine for the tribe. And so we continue to produce, continue to produce the seed, the seed every, every year. And uh, over the years, Helen and I have become um, so, I mean, such good friends and, and understanding of, of the Ponca Nation, and we've worked with them a lot. And so two years ago, we gave them the land that uh, we plant the corn on, and we also gave them some of the land that's on the actual Ponca Trail of Tears. Uh, so that's that's now theirs that they can say they, they, they now own. It's not much, but it's a little bit. Okay, another crop that we have is the sun. And, uh, it's actually, you know, I can just about guarantee it's the only crop I make money on every year. Some of the others we do and sometimes we don't. Um, we, put, we started this up in 2015 and it produces uh, 75 to 90% of the kilowatts that we used on the farm 
every year since then. Uh, we also, at that time, bought a bought a Chevy Volt, and we um, have been, uh, you know, driving that and getting miles out of that. And then here a few months ago, we upgraded to the Chevy Bolt. And so now every mile that we drive this car on, it's it's being powered by the sun and very sustainable. Now, in the past, back in, uh, you know, after the war, uh, people grew hemp. Uh, here for the for rope and the war effort, and we all know that this is part of the pack. This is great country for it. You know, we still have the wild remnants here, and uh, you know when the infrastructure is right and people can start farming this, it it uh, it will be awesome to have this new crop that is so valuable and so sustainable. And so I don't know whether whether I will live to see the day that we have hemp grown on this farm, but I would like to. Now, I also have included uh, here sources of information. This PowerPoint will be put up on the site, and there are lots of uh, sources here, and obviously this is just a drop in the bucket of places that you can look for the various topics that I have discussed. So uh, you can, uh, uh, take a look at some of these and like I said do some searching if you there's also the site on here with Bull Nebraska that that gives you a lot more detail about the Ponca corn if you care to look at that and our our uh, native relatives have a philosophy that I I think is so important you know we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors we borrow it from our children that's being a good steward and making sure that you take care of the land and preserve it for the future. So I thank you for uh, your uh, attendance on this and I'd be happy, happy to answer any questions. Um, like I said, I'm not, an, I'm not a complete expert, but you know, we've taken a journey and we're pretty happy with where we ended up on this journey. Thank you so much, Art. Wow, you like farming is definitely an art for anyone who does it, but you have brought in so many different aspects that make it so much more beautiful. So thank you for all the work that you've put in to make it more generative, and I know that takes a lot. Um, so we do have quite a few questions here we can go through. So the first one we've got is from Nancy and Alan Meyer. They ask, what has changed in no-till from when it didn't work in the past to where it does now? Uh, the thing that happened is back in the 80s when people were trying it, uh, nobody gave it time to work. They did it one, two, three years and they said, it's not working, I'm, I'm not doing it anymore. Uh, and they weren't doing any cover crops back then, et cetera. It, it, take, it takes time to get into this. Mm. Maya Moore says, Art, what advice would you give to farmers thinking about farming regenerative, regeneratively? specifically regarding responding to criticism and remaining resilient in the face of challenges, switching to regenerative practices. Wow, that, I, I, I could talk another hour about that. <laughs> I, think, I think it's, uh, it, you know, if you're in a place, if you're in a place where you can do this, I would say, go for it and and it might you might have to do it kind of like we did where you take certain steps at a time you know because uh you know i don't know your financial situation but most people have to have a banker involved and they aren't going to help you much if you want it uh, some will but uh, probably most are going to be a little more cautious even though their traditional farmers are are you know, going bankrupt right and left, uh, you know, whereas the regenerative people actually can make a living. So I, I would strongly encourage you to get into the regenerative mode. And of course, there are so many niche things in the regenerative movement. You know, one of the, one of the things that uh, I heard about a, uh, a tribe that, that had this uh, regenerative project started where they, um, where they grew their, um, uh, like their corn, 
and then they had chickens and so they would turn the chickens they would fence it off and they would turn the chickens into the corn and the chickens would eat you know all the weeds and they'd scratch around a little in the dirt and uh, leave a little additional uh, uh, compost there and so forth and uh, they hadn't been that far into it but they thought hey this is working this is this is working out great they said the biggest challenge is getting all those chickens back in the chicken house at night you know so so but you know there there are lots of niche operations out there within the regenerative world and i would encourage uh, i know if if i were younger i i would be i would be jumping at some of those opportunities hmm. thanks Mary that's a great question um, the next one from Dennis Grace said, are all of these techniques and systems you're using seem like fantastic innovations? What is it that keeps more farmers from doing the same? Innovative farming technique techniques seem to be one of the best ways to bring about climate change suppression. Oh, and it's absolutely one of the best, best ways to deal with climate change and, you know, sequestering that carbon. And there have been efforts in the past and sometimes they've, they've been, they've worked a little bit and that's to, you know, some kind of a program to pay farmers to sequester carbon. And here a few years ago, I was at, um, um, I was at a Farmers Union National Convention, and the one of the uh, actually one of our ne great Nebraskans was there and proposing a lot of regenerative type policies and so forth. And this older farmer gets up and he says, "If you don't pay me to do this stuff, I ain't gonna do it." You know, and unfortunately, that is the attitude is is you got to think beyond the dollar and you got to think what what kind of world are we going to leave in the future? And you've you know, uh, there are some programs and that's one of the reasons I left the NRCS uh, website up there where farmers can get a little bit of I know I started off uh, with a little bit of help. Uh, uh, from NRCS uh, to to get started with the no-till process and so forth. So there's a little bit of help there, but obviously not probably enough for most farmers to transform into that. Uh, it, you know, it, it's one of those things. And uh, uh, even here in Nebraska, you know, we've got a soil health committee working out of the legislature uh, that is trying to come up with some recommendations. And uh, I, w I was at a uh, nitrogen training here a year ago and some farmer gets up and he says, by God, uh, they aren't gonna tell me what to do on my farm. I'm gonna do what I wanna do. So we have a big challenge out there. It's a big challenge because they don't understand that there's a better way. They don't understand that we need to make these changes if our grandchildren and our great grandchildren want a world to live in. We've got to do it. It's so important. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. That was great. Kathy Prettyman asks Using cover crops, do you use less fertilizer? Um, yes, and you do use some, uh, you know, a little less fertilizer. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, every year when I sit down with my plan with the, you know, and unfortunately I still have to, I still have to buy some commercial fertilizer. I, I wish it weren't so. Uh, but every year, you know, he says, well, you need this much fertilizer. I say, no, I don't. No, I don't because uh, I'm, I'm raising 225 bushel corn and I'm not, you know, last year I didn't use that much fertilizer. I don't need to use it next year. Actually, I want to use a little less fertilizer. So every year for the last five years or well, maybe seven or eight years, I've been cutting down the amount of commercial fertilizer that I put on. And so you do, you can use less. And eventually if you, uh, if you can plant the right cover crops, uh, and get more legume cover crops in there, you, you know, that will help with your fertilizer too. Mm. That's awesome. <laughs> Kathy Jeffers asks, how does home gardener plant seeds into cover crop? Plant small seeds into cover crop. Uh, small seeds into cover crop. Well, um, I 
guess uh, <laughs> small seeds. Well, uh, I don't know the situation there, but we always, uh, uh, I mean, and of course, <laughs> Uh, I have this drill, and so every every year after the garden's done, I go out and plant a cover crop in the garden, and you can't do that. But you could possibly scatter some seed out and water it in. That's one way, you know, just like uh, when we plant with the uh, airplane, uh, we generally water that so so the so or so the seeds will actually germinate and then attach to the soil. So you could do the same thing where you basically spread spread it out. You know whether you've got one of those little hand uh, uh, grass seeder maybe things, and you go out and spread some seed out there, and then uh, just uh, just water it in, and you know hopefully it'll grow. I think it will. Mm, awesome. Um, John Jorgensen is wondering where folks can get Ponca corn seed to plant gardens or whatnot. And I know that Nancy and Ellen Meyer did know in the chat that they um, have some available, so you can email them. But do you have something to add to that, Art? Um, yeah, right. Right now, last year, last year we had a drought, uh, and we had very little seed. Uh, this year, I'm hoping for a good crop. Uh, so, you know, sometimes we, we have seed, uh, bold Nebraska, uh, sometimes, uh, well, I mean, not sometimes, uh, a lot of times we'll give out this seed, uh, in small packets as well as depending on what you're, what you're going to do with it. We've, we've taken, uh, this, uh, this Mika C's uh, mother, Casey Camp, has taken this seed all over the world in her travels as an indigenous uh, leader and speaker. Uh, and she's nicknamed it the Seeds of Resistance. And that, of course, that's another whole story. Uh, but um, uh, uh, Bold Nebraska, I think they still have some seed. I know we sent some seed out earlier this morning. I'm pretty well out of what I have right now. Uh, but I think bold may have may have some seed, and of course, if you uh, anybody that wants to come, I know the Myers have been here. Um, anybody that wants to come to like our harvest event, hopefully COVID will allow us to do that this fall. Uh, we can uh, probably get you some seed then. Awesome. And okay, we we have a few more questions, but we're just gonna stop accepting just to kind of move on to on schedule, but these are all great questions. Um, the next one, Peggy Danker asked, uh, do you soil test in relating to fertilizing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, soil tests are, soil tests are so important. You know, I do it, I do it every year. You know, they, they try and get you to do it um, not so often. And then see, then they think they can keep selling you, selling you more fertilizer all the time. So I do, I do mine every year, and we uh, we have slowly in, in sand. It's very difficult to grow your organic matter, but we have slowly been growing our organic matter in the sand. We've been improving that soil. So yes, soil soil tests are necessary, phenomenal. <laughs> and then there's um, another question. Um, is there crop insurance for no-till farms and how much less pesticides do you need? They said, it's my understanding that over time you have less disease. And ab ab absolutely, there, there is crop insurance for no-till farming, yes. Uh, and uh, with, the, um, uh, with pests, uh, yeah, we use uh, a lot fewer pesticides. And uh, you know, I absolutely refuse to put a fungicide on anymore. Uh, because uh, uh, that will also kill all my little critters that are in the soil. So, you know, we, we don't unless we absolutely have to. And the longer you do this, the less you'll need. I haven't, I haven't had to use a regular pesticide, gosh, for probably five years or so. So Crazy. the longer you do this, the less you use. And Amazing. that's good for everybody, too. Yeah. Wow. So good to hear. 
Um, and then last one from an anonymous attendee, what recommendations or encouragement do you have for young people who want to get into farming? Uh, you know, that is, uh, wow, well, it, it's a challenging, it's a challenging occupation and it's expensive to get started. And uh, uh, I encourage young people to find a farmer that they can partner with and that farmer can, you know, get somebody like me, my age, that is, you know, I'm 68 and a half years old, you know, so I, I, I want to do this forever because I love it so much, but physically, you know, how much longer can I do that? I don't know, you know, uh, but, you know, find an old geezer like me and, and see if you can partner and then have a plan to get into some kind of regenerative agriculture that you don't have to farm, you know, 2,000, 3,000 acres where you can do something on a small farm um, and, you know, you kind of have a niche uh, and you can be very profitable with that and then you can expand into other areas. I, I, we've got to have, we've got to have young farmers coming out because we're running out of them because it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not a good thing for traditional farming at this time. Not at all, but thank you. There's hope. And it's because of people like you are. So thank you for doing the work that you're doing. You're welcome. All right. Now we can transition over to our recycling presentation with Zaya. Zaya, you can go whenever you're ready. All right. Well, thanks, Dakota. I appreciate that. And Art, I really enjoyed your presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, even though I grew up on a farm uh, east of uh, your farm uh, over in Church County. Um, and I like to, uh, it occurred to me that we grew up on a dry farm. And dry farming, as I thought back about this presentation and, and my upbringing, I realized that's where I probably got interested in climate change because when you grow up on a, a dry land farm, you're always watching the weather. It is uh, what drives everything on, on a farm like that. Um, and I also had a, my father grew up during the depression. And uh, when you have uh, a mentor or a father who uh, lived through the depression, uh, you become a conservationist whether you want to or not because uh, they lived through some very tough times and um, consequently um, that really rubbed off on, on me which uh, I will uh, bring up my PowerPoint here um, I think I'm getting oh here we go do this correctly and share. Yeah, um, one of the things that I've come to learn over my 30 plus years in recycling and, and conservation work is that we could learn so much from nature. Um, the way we operate as a culture, as a society, we have pretty much acted as though we can't really learn anything from nature. We have to um, overcome nature. And one of the major things in, I think, both uh, farming as well as uh, my line of work in recycling is knowing that nature abhors, abhors waste. And um, the message should be to all of us, uh, and so should we. Because if we did that, uh, we would find that there's a lot of benefits um, that would uh, uh, come about for uh, everyone across society. And, you know, one of the things I know too, being in this business, is that waste is always in the eye of the beholder. Well, I've come to define waste uh, slightly differently. 
I think always, just as I've learned from uh, what nature, um, always are a resource. They're just waiting for alternative, sensible thinking to emerge. And that's often in short supply that uh, thinking, sensible thinking. So my company, First Star Fiber, we, we started in 1998 and we process recyclables from all over the Midwest uh, and parts of uh, Northeast Nebraska come to us and we turn it into um, commodities that we're selling all over the world, but mostly, and we really strive for this, we're trying to develop local markets. And I'll talk a little more about that later on. This is actually what nature has been doing since, um, the very beginning, you know, and it's because, uh, you know, we know we live on a finite planet. Here's, uh, I don't know if everyone can see that or not, but this is uh, the amount of waste that we are discarding uh, across this country every year. In Nebraska, we're, uh, uh, landfilling or uh, unfortunately spreading or littering or and I having grown up on a farm I know this is often the case as well uh, burning it in backyard um, uh, barrels and in fact I as a, uh, a child I know that I was burning a lot of stuff that never should have been burned but that's what we did if you look at this pie chart, one of the things that I think we miss as a society is just how much of this material is actually organic material. And Art, you talked about getting organic uh, material back into your soil. And I'll bet your soil has more organic material in it than uh, the majority of farms across this state and this region, because this has not been a practice. And yet every year of the 2 million tons or so that the uh, state of Nebraska communities are burying, um, better than 40% of that is probably organic material that could be composted and uh, made available to, to farmers, I believe, so that we could help support the uh, soil uh, amendments that is so critical to sustain our agricultural way of life. So that's one of the reasons why we should be caring about uh, this belief that we should not waste and if we uh, follow that we would do a lot of things. When I started uh, in recycling years ago that figure of five pounds per day that EPA now estimates was more like a little bit under four pounds. So what's happening? Well, uh, our buying habits have changed. Uh, we're uh, actually not really to blame for the fact that we waste more. A lot of that has to do with how uh, our uh, economy now works where a lot of the things that we buy do not come locally. They come to us from uh, other parts of the country and other parts of the world. And for them to arrive here, of course, we're talking about more packaging. We're also unfortunately, and this is a, again an EPA figure, that we're recycling just a little better than 25%, 26%. I dare say that in our region, that figure is much, much lower. And perhaps one of the major reasons for that, and, and Art, you had mentioned that it takes time to develop a regenerative and probably one of the big reasons why it doesn't take off with more farmers is uh, the, the belief that, well, it didn't work for the 1980s. We see that all the time here in Nebraska, that municipalities, uh, especially small, small, smaller municipalities um, have started recycling programs or if they've done, they're being done with volunteers. And then once the going gets tough, 
uh, and it does get tough. It's another similarity between recycling and farming. Uh, a lot of people have stopped. Other, and rather than try to figure out how to overcome some of those challenges. Um, and then I said, it's the yeah, salt waste is increasing recycling, it's decreasing. But there's other environmental issues why we should be doing this. Um, landfills, uh, they're the third largest source of methane um, in, in the world. Uh, that methane is contributing it's one of the worst contributors to uh, 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 climate change. And it seems so uh, odd to know that this is one of the things that is having a huge impact on our uh, climate. And yet it's very seldom talked about the fact that this is where a large chunk of our methane is coming from. Also the threat to land and groundwater. Um, one of the things that I fear that Nebraskans aren't fully aware of is up until the 1990s, every community of 5,000 population and less had what we affectionately called open burning dumps. And I say that with some tongue in cheek, but I know from the years when I ran the Nebraska Recycling Association that that was one of our biggest challenges to get people to recycle because it was so much easier for communities to let it go out to these little ravines in many uh, situations and periodically uh, put a match to it. And the uh, mindset actually was, well, that's what you do. And then when the state passed the amendment or the, the law in 1992, they weren't required to dig up those areas. Instead, they were covered over. And I'm fearful of what our groundwater sources are going to be contaminated with, because one of the things about solid waste, we have this mistaken belief that waste simply goes away. Well, it never goes away. It just goes somewhere else. Um, the uh, city of Hastings um, had to uh, put several of the farmers in the area around its landfill, its abandoned landfill on city water because the old landfills had leaked into their uh, well waters and contaminating them. Um, that's just one example. And when I think about all the open burning dumps that our state relied on for so many years, it makes me a little nervous to think about what the future might hold for a lot of the, the wells around the state and what we're doing to some of the water. Um, obviously, uh, the way we treat waste has a huge impact on our habitat uh, and the uh, material that's been getting the most attention of late, of course, is the um, plastics that are ending up in the oceans, which one of the things that I think we as Nebraskans also forget, we're contributing to that just as much as they are on the any of the coasts because the Missouri River drains into the Mississippi River and combined is uh, some of the biggest water uh, shed in, in the world draining right into the Gulf of Mexico. So the plastics that we are discarding um, here uh, in this country, as well as everything that comes off of a parking lot, it's got to go somewhere. It goes into stormwater uh, uh, sewers, and it's going into you know our waterways. So we can't look at this as oh we're not contributing to the problem of ocean, and we know that we're also degrading the. Uh, habitat for many of the native species that we have in this area. 
Um, and when we think about that, often we think about it in terms of, well, it attracts the nuisance pests of birds, flies, and animals. And yes, it does. Uh, but it's also degrading their livelihoods. And that's something that, uh, you know, how we deal with that. You mentioned too, and I, I had to smile when you said, Art, that uh, one of the things you have to do is train your banker to be able to uh, do regenerative farming. The same is true for uh, recycling. Uh, when we started, we probably saw about six different banks before we found one that was willing to take a uh, uh, take us on as a, a customer. Um, recycling uh, back in the, well, when I started was way back in the 1980s, but when we started our company in uh, the late 90s, um, recycling was uh, considered a new industry, even though uh, um, uh, the, even um, Americans had been recycling clothing and scrap metal and a lot of other things for many, many generations, but it's, it wasn't considered a real industry, even though it actually has grown to be a several billion dollar impact on the U.S. industry uh, because of things that are going back into the uh, uh, circular economy. Um, there's also health implications, um, as I, and I mentioned the one about exposure to hazardous materials that are in the landfills that are leaking. One of the things that I uh, had a conversation with a landfill engineer, um, he designed landfills, and the sanitary landfill is probably one of the biggest um, misnomers ever uh, put on the face of the earth. Uh, and he said as much, there is no such thing as a landfill that will ever not leak because the amount of work that goes into a sanitary landfill with the concept that it'll all stay there, they, they put down uh, plastic uh, tarp at the bottom of the landfills that will wear out and that material leachate, which is what the, the organics as well as any hazardous material will eventually degrade that plastic and it will continue to move as it finds the way off the site. That's why you have monitoring wells around all the sanitary landfills. Is it to stop it? No, it's just to identify when it eventually happens. So when you think about all the different things that we as consumers are buying and using, um, there's a lot of chemicals in there that we don't even have any clear idea of how they interact with one another, much less on their own. So those are things that, uh, eventually i think we're going to have to take account as we think about how do we get back to um, looking at waste as other than that it's something that will be with us unless we think of them as resources so with that in mind you know i think we've all heard of the uh, three r's well there's probably a fourth one that doesn't get cited too much and the first one is refuse uh, and again I, I go back to perhaps my roots and my father who um, would always uh, tell us that you know if we tamp down our expectations about how we use resources they'll be around a lot longer for everyone um, every year we would go uh, over our christmas break my dad would buy an old farmhouse, and then that's how we would spend our Christmas break, tearing those old buildings down so that he could reuse the lumber. And then I often, being one of the younger ones, I spent my uh, Christmas breaks straightening nails so that they could be reused again. So uh, that's just the way things 
where then and uh, you know some of these things we need to come back to doing it's encouraging that a lot of this is taking place and i've seen a lot of changes over the years in this area recycling itself um, does again prevent resource uh, destruction that's pretty obvious but it's also returning products back to manufacturing and that is uh, becoming more and more of the prominent way that manufacturers, not just uh, environmentalists, are thinking. They're looking at it as many of the same reasons that um, regenerative farming makes sense. Uh, it saves money. Um, the fact is that uh, Recycling will cut down on energy use. Uh, virtually all the materials that we touch, it has a tremendous reduction in energy use. It's also decreasing uh, air pollution and water pollution, uh, in, uh, depending on the material in question. So it's, it has a lot of economic reasons for it, which um, is probably one of the the most encouraging things that I've come across in my career is that when we started out, um, the uh, paper industry is a good example. Very few paper industries wanted to deal with any recycled uh, paper. And one of the primary reasons for that was it was so much easier for them to buy trees the um, handful of, of suppliers relative to 350 million suppliers, in other words, residents, made it a lot more difficult to do. But one of the paper mills that made uh, toilet paper as well as cardboard realized this was a much uh, cheaper source of feedstock. They were among the first. And um, I know this from one of the gentlemen that I recruited to serve on my board of directors, used to be the COO of Scott Paper. And he said that when their board and when he found out that this competitor was lowering their feedstock uh, costs significantly compared to what Scott Paper was. And he said that changed everything overnight where they started looking into where do we find this? How do we set this up? And they helped develop the industry that um, I now uh, live with uh, as a processor and a supplier for the uh, paper industry. Um, aluminum cans is another major one is saving 95% energy and air pollution. So this goes on with all the different materials, including the one that we probably over on the left hand screen here, we think the least about. Um, we were the first uh, recycling operation in the country to make this program a permanent part of our offering. The hefty energy bag is going after some of the least recyclable or the most difficult plastics that can be recycled because of a variety of reasons. Either they're very lightweight, they're very easily discarded, and uh, anyone who's ever walked down a uh, street and saw you know, bottle caps and straws, and you know that we as a culture do litter a lot. All those types of things though, are still a resource. It just took some alternative sensible thinking uh, to come about and this hefty energy bag is, is one of the ways to do that. Um, it has taken off significantly here in the Omaha area. People are buying these bags uh, at the store, all the local grocery stores now sell these orange bags. Uh, there's instructions as to how to, uh, what type of material should go in there. And, and you can see it's a pretty hefty 
list of materials, no pun intended, of candy wrappers and uh, spoons and all types of plastics that otherwise could not be recycled, but by putting them in the bags, when they come to, they're set out with their other recyclables, we pull the bags off at our um, uh, material recovery facility. We're bailing it, and right now it's being used as an alternative fuel source. However, um, we have sent some to be made into diesel. We have sent some to be made into plastic lumber. And when I say we've sent, that means we don't have that outlet here locally. However, um, that's something that we're working on and we feel pretty confident that uh, by this time next year, we'll be turning a lot of these materials right here in Nebraska into plastic lumber, um, decking that um, is um, a replacement for wood that's been treated um, chemically retreated um, and it'll be very cost effective. We also believe that eventually we'll be making diesel that could power arts tractor and as well as many others uh, across the state because obviously uh, we need that fuel source. So those are some of the things that we're doing to try to uh, bring about uh, a reduction of what's going to landfill. Ultimately, too, these plastics um, can be chemically recycled back into plastics again. And we know that there's a lot of work going on in that area. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the suppliers of the system that we're looking to, to uh, turn these plastics into diesel is in conversations with some of the large petroleum companies about sending that material off to a refinery where they will turn it back into the plastics that will turn back into the products that we're using every day in our, in our life. So a lot of gains coming about in terms of how we look at the so-called waste and treat them as resources. Um, it's also uh, encouraging just how well, the public is taking hold of uh, the whole concept of, of recycling. This is something that Henry Ford is here for. So uh, one of the things that I like about that is that, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, obviously, if a bird can do it, so can we, uh, as often in the comment that the zoo has uh, mentioned as we uh, show that around. And they put that together without any prompting from us. Um, so I guess my, primary takeaways from uh, these few minutes with you is that there is a lot that we can do as a species to protect not just other species but ourselves 
we just have to become a little smarter about how we go about doing that. And I have uh, tremendous optimism that we can achieve the things that uh, will make this a much better world over uh, the long term, because we do have to be patient. But then when I think about uh, folks like you, Dakota, and all the other people who are working so diligently at Conservation Nebraska, um, I take tremendous satisfaction from that. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Dakota, to uh, go ahead and uh, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer. Oh, thank you, Dale, that's so sweet. It's amazing the amount of um, groups and organizations that we have in Omaha doing things like this, you know, it really is. And just like our, you know, we need regenerative agriculture and we need programs like you're creating, Dale. So thank you for your work in this because I know um, as any environmentalist, everyone listening, it's, it's a fight and you have to continue, you know, it's exhausting and you really have to get creative and um, work around what our societies have put in place and um, continue keeping on. So thank you. Thank you all. And thank you guys. Um, we do have quite a few questions still, if you're ready to answer some questions. My okay. Best. okay, awesome. So let's see. First one, we'll start with from Maya. They asked, it is my understanding that a lot of non-organic materials that are recycled in the U.S. do not end up being recycled and are instead passed along globally to several countries that do not want to recycle it slash don't have the infrastructure to do so. What is your vision for a future where this is no longer a problem? Well, actually, it has reduced as a problem quite a bit just in the last uh, several years. And a lot of that has to do with uh, most of that material was actually going to China, um, although there are still uh, a lot of demand for materials in some of the other developing countries. But um, this country has been slow relative to other parts of the world in uh, establishing the infrastructure to, to deal with this material here locally. But it is changing. Um, you may have heard of the uh, uh, China had what it was called the uh, green fence where they put up um, uh, not physically, but they cut off much of the world and not just the US, but Europe as well from sending materials that they felt was too contaminated. And that has had a huge impact on, on changing uh, the um, uh, mindset of uh, the industries that we rely on heavily to use this material. So right now I would say that less than 3% uh, of what we send uh, out of our facility and we process and market close to 100,000 tons a year uh, is actually going to um, China and actually it's it's showing up there as a pre-processed material because the Chinese still need these resources. So what have the Chinese companies done? They have bought old mills here in the US and they're pulping the paper that they used to take in a raw form. They're now um, pulping it, cleaning it, and shipping the clean fiber over to run their mills. And we're going to see more on that uh, in the coming years simply because um, these are resources. And uh, I mentioned earlier that the U.S. is disposing, the average American is generating five pounds a day of, of waste. Um, that's just what we as consumers are doing when you take into account what industries are doing, that figure is much higher. The rest of the world realizes those are resources and that's why they're being shipped elsewhere. Mm. And to give you an idea of why we don't think of them as resources is because we thought, you know, this was, un the resources here in this country are so vast that we could just keep using, using, and using 
mm -hmm. urgent. Mm -hmm. that changing. Do you think um, because China and um, yeah, because China stopped taking those, has it brought up more innovation within our nation? Very much so. Um, yeah, very much so. Okay, good. That's what I was hoping would come up. That. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, we have some questions about the orange hefty bag. Um, I thought I'd kind of wrap them into one. So one of them is what mm, orange hefty bag. Doesn't the conversion process cause horrible pollution? Another one is, I heard Hefty is really just a marketing ploy to sell more plastic bags. I don't think it is a solution we need to reduce. Well, no to both questions. Uh, um, actually, we are sending it to a cement kiln uh, currently, but that is a short-term thing because we have to develop some of these sensible alternatives, as I mentioned. But I can tell you this, that uh, the um, cement kiln was burning fuel that doesn't burn as hot as the plastics. And a friend of mine who works for the environmental uh, agency here in Nebraska told me that the irony is this material will burn hotter and thus cleaner. And this cement uh, kiln was actually fully vetted by Dow and Reynolds before we started sending anything there. Because the last thing they want, of course, is for uh, this to end up causing more pollution than what it, it saves. Um, and, you know, obviously I can't speak for Reynolds solely but the number of bags that the cells versus other materials that are going into the bags is a very small, very, very small percentage. And yes, I'm sure that they would like to sell more bags, um, but that is always the case whenever you have a solution uh, of any type, uh, you have to look at what are the benefits of it. We're seeing about 20 tons a month now of the materials that otherwise would have gone to the landfill being recovered and used for alternatives such as the cement kiln. And then again, by this time next year, I hope we're making plastic lumber and also eventually um, we're part of a solution to turn this back into uh, plastics again to have a full circle so that we can cut down on some of the petroleum that we otherwise are drilling. Mm -hmm. And do you think this is possibly more of like a transitional, you know, because of course it is reduced first. So this can be kind of, since this is in the system and, you know, realistically we do use these plastics right now, um, or many people do, this can just be more of a transitional program. That, that's exactly. And that's how everything that I've ever seen in recycling, it's been a transitional thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it takes quite a bit to change um, since the Industrial Revolution to change the mindsets of how we operate our economy. Mm -hmm. But it, I mean, and it is happening. Mm -hmm. um, a few people were wondering where to buy those hefty bags at and who collects the energy bags once I fill them. I know someone was asking about um, if you don't have it picked up at your house, where can you drop them off at? Sure. Um, to answer that question last, there's um, drop-off sites uh, that are listed on the um, uh, city of Omaha's waistline. There's five sites around the city. Bellevue, I believe, still has some drop-off sites too. So you can take your bags to any of those locations and set it out set it in with the rest of the recyclables and it'll eventually come to our company, uh, First Star Fiber. Um, and then it, all of the area uh, haulers, including the city of Omaha's hauler, uh, you can set them out at the curb too with your other recyclables and they come to us as well. They're also, you can purchase them at uh, uh, Hy-Vee family, 
uh, Fair, uh, Menards, Home Depot, some of the targets, not all of them, but um, it's virtually all the, the local grocery stores now. Okay. Um, John Cruz just asked, we live in Seward, where do we take our bags? Ah, good question. Um, probably at this point in time, John, uh, unfortunately, you'll have to bring them to Omaha. You can use those drop-off sites as well. We are hopeful that we can eventually take this uh, statewide. We know that Ogallala, uh, the recycler there, has adopted using the energy bags and actually selling the energy bags to residents um, to help finance his recycling operations so that he can do more than just the energy bag. It's, uh, more possible for a good part of central and western Nebraska now that he is servicing now has access to uh, because he can do more than just uh, your typical newspaper and cardboard. Mm. Awesome, awesome. Um, let's see. Okay, Kathy has been reaching out to me via email about this and I wasn't sure. She's wondering if the pumps from soap bottles can be put into the orange hefty bags because there's that little bit of metal in that piece, the spiral thing. What do you think about that? Um, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with the metal, but really if it is a part of the um, pump, just put it back onto your plastic bottle and put it in with your other recyclables because you can... Uh, those metals uh, and those plastics, when we send it off to the processor, what they're going to do is grind it up and then there will be a magnet that will pull the metal off so that it's, I can't speak for the processors, but some I know uh, do make a, a point of trying to recycle the metal as well. And then I think you sort of answered this, but just to reiterate, Jane's wondering how the material from the hefty bags is processed. She's heard that it was burned, and if that is true, she, she's wondering about the emissions. Uh, well, the emissions, again, are less than the other materials that they would otherwise burn, which was uh, oil and coal. And it burns, because it burns hotter, uh, there's fewer emissions, but also the uh, cement kiln has state-of-the-art uh, scrubbers that cleans their emissions to uh, very high standards. And when we um, do set up a, the process for plastic lumber, obviously it's all gonna be turned back into a plastic lumber. We're working with a Canadian firm that has um, developed a extrusion process so that we're able to take a wide variety of resins, mix them together and make a, a good product out of it. And the pyrolysis, it's almost an entirely um, closed loop because um, any of the emissions that come off that haven't converted back into diesel, we actually use to heat the process. So it's, it's pretty well contained there and that's a, a very small part, it's like uh, two, three percent of the mm. unit. Another question about Western Nebraska getting local recycling. Um, many agencies are cutting back or shutting down services, especially in the rural areas. So there's no option for having recycling being picked up by the garbage collectors and they drive an hour out to Omaha or Lincoln to drop off. Do you have any foresight into, you know, more recycling going like out more westward? We do. Yeah. And we believe that is possible. In fact, we will be working, uh, we're actually looking to hire someone right now to work with us um, to do community outreach in other parts of the state that, um, you know, it, it can be done. A lot of it is having access to understanding how the markets work, understanding what equipment should be used. And last but not least, in fact, it's probably the most important thing is uh, recognizing 
that what communities that think recycling is too expensive generally are not taking into account the externalized costs of using landfills as their approach to dealing with these materials. Um, and it's the um, same way with um, the question that you received, Art, about what's it going to take to get more farmers to adopt um, these types of, of practices that you are doing so capably well. It's getting across to them, you're losing money. <laughs> and you're losing money in these communities that aren't recycling. Uh, you're losing money of your farmer and you're going by old techniques that we need to get rid of them and change our mindset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, relating back to the, the marketing, um, there's a question about how there are a lot of small municipal landfills that say the cost of recycling is too high. Are there grants available for startup operations and what banks are open to funding? Well, there's some of the um, brand companies and by brands, I mean, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, uh, Walmart, others have funded a program called the Closed Loop Fund and uh, others uh, have funded a program called Recycling Partnership. Uh, we would be more than happy to work with any small town that wants to get back into recycling or start recycling for the first time, uh, help to access these grants that are available. Grants or the closed loop fund is a low interest loan, but uh, there's many things that are going on across the country now that we can help communities and this will be one of the things that this uh, community outreach person that we're hiring will help do as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question I often have as well. Can we recycle soft drink cups or like coffee cups with the paper recycling? I've heard because of the lining, you can't. It is more difficult um, if it was in the let me back up. One of our end markets here in this state that we support for the majority of our paper is a cellulose insulation company in uh, Norfolk. And they um, are our best market. They really don't want those cups in there. If we were in other markets um, that um, will pulp the paper, uh, the plastic will separate from the paper and um, depending on the mill, they may recover both. Unfortunately, uh, we're too far from uh, these other mills to really make that a practice, an ongoing practice, to pull out just individual cups. And our end market, the, when they grind to make cellulose insulation, that little bit of plastic that's left uh, contaminates their end product. So that's why we don't encourage people to, to put in that type of material in there. As far as plastic cups, though, because I think that was part of the question as well, um, that um, isn't as big of a problem because we are um, pulling out those types of plastics and um, we're sending it off to uh, end markets where they're either making plastic lumber or um, other materials. And when we have our own plastic lumber uh, plant, we'll, we'll be putting that in there as well. Mm. Hmm. Interesting, thank you. Um, this is a big question. What would, it, uh, what would it take to end the production of plastic? Probably the biggest thing is for the the country to stop driving cars. Mm. I don't think uh, it will ever go away, unfortunately, but what uh, is often overlooked is that when they refine the oil that comes off, comes out of the ground, plastics used to be considered a waste product that they would flare off. 
uh, it's different um, uh, emission that doesn't make it back into um, oil because they don't want these lighter um, gases. The plastics industry is a small part of our petroleum based economy. And what we need to do if we're going to really cut back on plastics uh, or, and I don't think we'll ever get rid of plastics per se, but maybe turning some of our corn into plastics, a bile, is going to have to compete against the petroleum industry that otherwise is trying to cut its costs down. Um, and that's where how plastics really got a foothold in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, a waste product that someone figured out how to make something more productive from. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a victim of our own success. Yeah, we are. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> uh, okay, now Lincoln Recycling, we've got some Lincoln questions here. Um, one of them, in the past I've brought styrofoam containers to the styrofoam recycling company in Omaha. I was unclear if they only accepted larger styrofoam materials. I had a few food containers. Some workers told me it was okay to put them in, but signs dictated otherwise. Are you able to clarify this and where is a place to recycle styrofoam in Nebraska? I live in Lincoln. Sure. Um, I know the firm that they're referring to, and I suspect that they only want the large materials simply because how of their handling process, as well as concern that if they open it up to food uh, containers, they're fearful that they're going to get more food waste, uh, which is a common concern for a lot of the young markets. Um, so probably the better answer, and in Lincoln, uh, depending on who your hauler is, uh, you can uh, purchase the energy bag at the grocery stores in Lincoln. hy V, I I know, is carrying them there. And it can go right into the uh, energy bag. Uh, but uh, try to take out most of your uh, food waste out, out of that as well. But you don't have to make it pristinely clean uh, for the energy bag. Mm -hmm. Lincoln has just reduced their public recycling sites from around 19 to 4 and has added a policy that fines those who are unable to recycle their cardboard. Are you working to fight this new cut in Lincoln's recycling resources and what can Nebraskans and Lincolnites do about it? Well, I think the reason the city is doing it is for the reason that a lot of communities are struggling right now. They've lost a lot of their revenue and running, um, and I, um, I don't know the exact number, but the reducing the number of drop-off sites, the city is trying to cut back on its uh, uh, outlay to manage those, which is significant. Um, what the city has also talked about doing is try, because virtually all, well, in fact, all of the garbage haulers in Lincoln now have to offer curbside service. And the um, city has talked about how to incentivize and, and encourage more people to sign up for that service because the city is finding it challenging to service that many drop-off sites. Um, but uh, it's less convenient for people to use the drop-off sites now because the city had made a very, um, um, so many of them made it very convenient, but they now realize that they just cannot continue to uh, um, offer it to that level. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question here about, um, let's see. It looks like there is someone that is from Mexico and um, He's saying that there we separate organic, inorganic recyclables. And I know um, he's asking, do you have an incineration waste plant or just landfills in Nebraska? We just have landfills, uh, except for the burn barrels that a lot of communities still allow. 
um, people to use and they're they're burning a lot of things that should never be burned under those conditions. Mm. Mm. Good for you. Um, and you <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. Um, there is a question about uh, if a truck could come periodically to the Seward Recycling Center to pick up energy bags. Would that be a solution? Well, actually it could be. Um, with the, the city of Seward Recycle More, and we do send out trucks into communities to not just the energy bags, but cardboard uh, and the other materials that are kept in a way that it then has greater value. Uh, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you know, about that. I remember from years ago when I lived in Crete that Sewer did have a pretty good recycling program. In fact, for a long time, they were claiming to be the first recycling uh, community program in the state. So it was Blair, so it was, it was an ongoing competition. Who was the first? <laughs> well, with, with that too, um, there's a question about, what about people who cannot afford a drop-off service? I cannot afford the drop-off, probably because they can't get to it. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Um, you know, if the renters, I would love to see the landlords take more responsibility for that because a lot of the uh, it's uh, ordinance that landlords, uh, especially apartment complexes, have to offer um, trash collection but they don't have to offer recycling. Now, some of your better landlords, and I should say better, but some landlords realize that they attract better tenants and they keep their grounds cleaner when they do offer uh, a recycling component to their services. So that might be something that someone might wanna look into is talk to your building manager to see if that is available to you. There's also a program here in the Omaha metro area, a company called RecyclePal that offers um, recycling service. They'll come right to your door and they provide you with a um, paper bag to put your recyclables in and they come by weekly, I think, to pick it up and it is a service. A lot of the um, department um, complexes are charging all of their uh, tenants maybe a dollar extra a month to get that service and they contract for with RecyclePal to offer that. That's neat. Um, are, this is a question for you. Um, are there options for farmers to look at perennial plants or trees rather than annual? Okay, uh, for trees, would, would you repeat that? I, I didn't catch yeah. it. Yeah, of course. Um, are there options for farmers to look at perennial plants or trees rather than annual? Oh, I think absolutely. One of the uh, uh, probably critical issues is, you know, uh, marketing and so forth as to, you know, how you're going to market those products. So that's probably a more challenging uh, you know, because I know there are people that grow, uh, you know, various nuts and so forth uh, that, uh, you know, but they already have their markets and so forth. Mm, okay. um, and then last recycling question, um, and this goes towards like how to challenge arguments and talk about these things. Uh, Dennis is wondering, uh, he says, Dale, you touched on it a moment ago, a while back, regarding cheaper to buy trees. One of the arguments against recycling that I've heard is that processing recyclables and remanufacturing them creates more waste and pollution and adds an unnecessary step in the system. What are ways to challenge that argument? Well, there is national uh, legislation being uh, in other countries. Uh, we're seeing some of it in Canada. It's called extended producer responsibility which says that these uh, companies that are selling widgets or whatever 
would also have to look at the end of life for their packages or even their products and start thinking about, okay, what can we do to mitigate the um, costs that have been externalized? In other words, someone else is paying for it. Uh, how can they help get the circular economy uh, to back it? Um, unfortunately, I think it would be tough for us to get that type of legislation in Nebraska completely. However, there has been conversations among officials, municipal and county officials about looking at it, starting small, if you will. Uh, there are some industries such as the paint industry has come up with a voluntary program to help try to reduce the amount of paint that is otherwise going into the landfill. And we're starting to see the, the the mere threat of this has uh, awoke uh, a lot of companies to start thinking about how they can get ahead of it. And again, I mentioned the closed loop fund. Uh, they just received another $54 million from various companies that want uh, sensible thinking uh, and they're willing to help pay for it. So that is going to generate a lot of potential for this ongoing uh, problem of how to get the, the world, much less the US, to become more thinking in terms of a circular economy. Wow, that's awesome. That's so hopeful that they're giving all that money. That's, oof, that's awesome. Um, we have a question about um, asking you if you could come and come to Seward as a program speaker for Rotary Kiwanis. So John Cruz is super excited about you and thinks that would be a great way to spread it to Seward. Sure, as long as we can do a little social distancing when I get there, John, I'm, I'm well for it. No, I'd be happy to. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Oh my gosh, thank you for all those answers. Wow, I think those are all the questions here. Um, Nancy and Alan Meyer did want to mention everyone how important the NRDs are. So um, if you don't know what the natural resource districts are, they are super important and um, they just wanted me to bring them up. I'll post their link in the chat. They have a ton of great resources and they also have elected officials onto their board. So if we can get right-minded people on there, we can move a lot along with their power. Um, so since we are nonpartisan, I cannot speak towards who is running or who is on the board, but um, give that link a look and just browse that over. And if you have time, educate yourself on who is running so we can get some great people in our areas. Um, yeah, just wanted to mention that. And the recording will be available, everyone, just so you know. It will be on our Facebook event page as well as the Conservation Nebraska page. So I will post that link into the chat. I know that this event has gone an hour over time. <laughs> So up to our speakers, if they want to continue to do the discussion, um, up to them. What do you guys think? Well, I'm about to talk out. I don't know about you, Art. Yeah, yeah, I, I am too. This is this has been uh, this has been a great day, and uh, I've enjoyed it tremendously. And uh, you know, I I really wish we would have got to know ourselves, uh, know each other back in the early 70s, you know. <laughs> I think we would have been great friends about life, so. <laughs> well, how crazy that you guys went to the same college, the same year. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. insane. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are getting a lot of appraise from all the participants, everyone saying thank you and how awesome of a discussion this was. Um, oh, Nancy Allen would love if 
Dale, you could reach out to her through her email. It's right in the chat there or her phone number um, regarding a good person for recycling outreach, for that recycling outreach job, she said. Oh, great. Um, and then she said that art at the Center of Rural Affairs, we are favoring loans for small regenerative farmers. So that's cool. Center of Rural Affairs is awesome. You guys are doing so much great work. I think that's it, you guys. Thank you so much for doing all of this. What an incredible event. I learned so much from both of you. Thank well, you. Thanks, thanks for, for asking. Making. Yeah, thanks for making this possible. <laughs> of course. I'll keep trying to do more. Keep you in the loop. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thanks so much, you guys. Have a beautiful day. Bye now. Bye.